<laughs> y'all something else. How many hungry for God's word this morning? Come on, y'all. Let's get right into this right now. I want you to go in your Bible to 1 Chronicles chapter 12. 1 Chronicles chapter 12. King David has taken over the kingdom. God raised up King David in the place of Saul. Saul, because of his disobedience to God, and really when you see his life, it's amazing how much of the fear of man he, he really possessed. God displaces and replaces King Saul and has raised up David. And now David is getting his army together. He's getting his warriors together because David was not just a worshiper, saints. He was a warrior. He was mighty in battle. He was very valiant. He was willing to take on the lion and the bear. He was willing to take on Goliath. The nations in that region were, were his reputation went before him. It preceded him. The people understood that this guy, he's dangerous. This guy, he cut off Goliath's head. David was very, very powerful. And as an individual who God had raised up, now God is bringing forth his warriors. And in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, we pick this, uh, let's just take a look at verse 32. Because as he goes down, he begins to talk about um, the divisions that were equipped for war. And it came to David at Hebron, so that as he goes over into the kingdom, he has these. And then he starts talking about the 12 tribes of Israel. And one of the tribes here is what, who I really want to pay attention to. He says, of the sons of Issachar, verse 32, and of the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times, just write that down, underline that, to know what Israel ought to do. Their chiefs were 200, and of their brethren, and he says, and all their brethren were at their command. So these individuals, the sons of Issachar, he says two things. He said they had understanding of the times, and then they knew what to do. The title of my message this morning is Discerning the Times. Discerning the Times. You know, it's imperative that we take time to really observe what's going on around us. And like I talked about last year, that we, can, that we have a sensitivity to seeing the kingdom. Um, revelation, and I spoke about this last week, revelation also comes by way of looking at our circumstances. What is happening around us? What do we see taking place? What we see is going to speak to us. It talks to us. And it's, it's revealing something concerning uh, the time in which we live. But do we have uh, the vision to be able to see what really is going on? And for these un individuals, the sons of Issachar, who are part of, who were warriors for the kingdom, I love it. It says that these individuals, it says they knew, they understood the times they understood the times. They comprehended. This, this Hebrew word means comprehension. And then most importantly, watch this, y'all. It means to discern it. To discern the times. They were able to. This is a part of what they brought to the kingdom. They were able to discern the times. Understand the times. Comprehend the times. And if there ever was a time in Christendom when we needed to understand and comprehend and discern the times, how many know it's right now, y'all? There's so many things going on on the planet, and then we're able to gain access to that information through, you know, social media, through what's going on on television, and then just the ways in which we're able to access information. A lot is coming at us, but are we able to discern what's truly going on? Can, do we see it? And, and so for us as the saints of, uh, saints of God, we should be the entity in the earth that's able, because we have revelation, 
we're able to discern and give clarity to the rest of the world. This is what is taking place. You may not want to hear it. You may not like it. You may not totally want to receive it, but we are blasting a trumpet declaring to you this is what's going on in the earth. And he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying. And so here we see that they had understanding. They were able to comprehend. Okay, I, the times. Oh, I see where we're at. King David, watch this. Be careful about this. Be sensitive about this. Okay, King David, make sure you're, okay, this is where we're at. This is what God said would happen. Be, be careful. Be able to discern it. They're able to discern the times. And so for us, it's something that we should have. And then it says here, not only to discern the times or to understand the times, he says to know what Israel ought to do. So I want to be able to discern, but then once I discern it, what do I do? This, this Hebrew word, yada, it is, it is experiential knowledge. So it's something that you experience. And so by way of experience, you gain knowledge and insight. I'm living in this time and then I'm experiencing this time. And this time is also helping me to understand, okay, this is what's going on. And this is what I should do. This is what I should do as a result of that. And we, we need to know what's going on. But then by the grace of God, we need to know what to do. And so we see very clearly here this was a part of David's team. It was a part of his, his uh, the team that assisted him in going from nation to nation, destroying, tearing down, building up, conquering, God using him mightily to advance the kingdom of God and being used as an instrument. He had access to those who could discern or Understand the times, but also know exactly what to do. And this is what we need in this time and in an age in which we live. Can I have an amen? amen? Luke chapter 12, verse 54. Luke chapter 12. Now, as we go to Luke here, you're going to see Jesus say something. That's important. Look what he says in verse 54. Because this helps to give us a little bit more clarity. It says here in verse 54. Then he also said to the multitudes, whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say a shower is coming. And so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be hot weather. And there it is. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? How is it that you do not discern this time? So now this tells me that from a discernment standpoint, my discernment has to go beyond just the natural. I also have to perceive what is taking place in the spirit. Now, this, the natural is going to tell me and help me to understand what's taking place in the spirit. But the issue here is, I love it, Jesus calls this hypocritical. So you guys know this, and you're talking about this, but you don't acknowledge this. And you, you can't discern and understand this, and this is something that we need in the body. We want to be able to discern, see what's going on in the natural, understand natural things, but more importantly, understand spiritual things and the ramification of those things. He says here, he says, hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth. You, you can discern the natural things, but how is it that you do not discern this time you don't discern this time i love this this time that you know when you when you go through the bible the bible is such a powerful tool for revelation for discernment 
for understanding, for all those things. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees and even the religious of their day, they had the holy canon and they would read the Bible but still found no insight into what God was really doing. And watch this, because they were blinded by their own desire. It had been prophesied that Jesus would come and that this was the time. It had been prophesied and laid out in the book of Daniel the weeks and the months and the days and those the characteristics that would that 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 would take place on the earth that would give you a sign that that something is happening that the messiah isn't he supposed to come and i don't want to get too too heavy into it but what i will say is they knew that something was on the horizon but because it, he didn't come the way they wanted him to come, they rejected him. Because he didn't look the way they wanted him to look, they rejected him. Because he didn't come and immediately deliver them from the Roman oppression, they said, this must not be him. Because he didn't come with splendor and, and, and all the other things that they were looking for, from a natural standpoint, they clearly just overlooked him and did not receive him as the Messiah. He says, you can't discern the times. You guys know this, you guys know this, but you cannot discern the times. And he called this hypocritical. I think it's, in, it's important for all of us to always stop and make sure that we don't have things in our lives in terms of desire that could blind us from clearly seeing what we need to see. And so here... He says here, and I'm going to read it again. Listen, saints. He says, hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern, he says, this time? Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. This is what I really wanted to, to camp out around. Look at this. I hope I didn't mess this up. Here we go. Sometimes I do. Second Peter chapter one, verse 16. Let's look at verse 16. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. This is the Mount of Transfiguration. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed. God said it would happen, then we saw it. It's confirmed. Which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now here it is, y'all. Because this verse that I'm getting ready to read is how we're able to discern the times. We're able to know what to do. And we're able to make sure that we have the right reference point so that we can discern the times and know what to do. He says, knowing this first, verse 20, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private origin or interpretation. For prophecy name never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now this is so powerful. 
And the reason why is because God, he says, no prophecy of the scripture. What he's saying is, is the prophetic aspect of this scripture, you always have to keep in mind, is divinely inspired. And it is of no private interpretation or origin, meaning God is going to make sure he disseminates it and under, so that many people gain an, uh, understanding, not just one, and not just one person receive the revelation. And so we have to see that if God says that the prophecy of the Scripture has been given by him and is of no private interpretation, then we have to see that everything that is, God has already declared. And then, because he's so good to us, he's already declared it. No, I just feel the anointing on this. He's, he's already declared it, but then he says, I'm not only just going to declare it, I'm going to put it in a book so that you can always have a point of reference for understanding about what you see going on in the land. Now, you're going to need the author to, in, to give you help in understanding what he wrote. But this holy canon is not just telling you about your past. It's not just telling you about your future. This Bible is prophetic. It's telling you about, it's telling you, it's not just telling you about your present. It's telling you about your future. And so when we look at this book, we have to stop, we have to, we have to stop thinking that our primary source of revelation concerning what's going on on the planet is what we see on the news. Because God in his omniscience is giving us insight into that which is to come. He's telling us about the future. All we have to do is read our, pick up our Bible. He's telling us about what's to come. And not only is he telling us about what's to come, he tells us what's coming, and then he says, this is what you should do. When you hear wars and rumors of wars, when he starts talking, he's telling us, this is how you, but don't fear. My father will give you what to say. He tells us, this is what you do. This is how you're going to respond. But what happens is we can get so consumed by the information that's coming on us that we don't stop and say, wait a minute, that the Bible it has prophecy and the prophecy of the Scripture is my main source of information and revelation. And it's the tool that God is going to use to help me to stay in tune with him and to know the times. It's going to tell me about the times. And then also to know what to do. And so we have to stop, we have to pause, and always when we hear something coming at us, we have to say, measure it and weigh it by what does the Bible say about that? What does it say? What does it say? What does the scripture have to say about the Babylonian Empire? About the Medio Persian Empire? About the Grecian Empire? About the Roman Empire? About the ten toes? How about the iron that's mixed with clay? What does it have to say about the out of that, that a, out of that a rock was cut out? And then that rock dashes against the image that Daniel saw and then all everything fell and the only thing that was left was the rock that was cut out. What does the Bible have to say about what's happening in the earth right now? What does it have to say about this? So is, is, there, is there a reference point in the scripture that I can see and be able to discern the times so I can be like the sons of Issachar to know the times and then know exactly what to do? When I hear of this when I, see, when I see pestilence, and when I see, can I have an amen, y'all? When I see these things, these plagues coming, and I see things happening, what does the Bible say about all that? When I see hurricanes, and I see, and I see the things taking place on the planet that just seems like it's just real, I can't, I can't, I can't blame everything on global warming. 
But what is going on here? What, what did God say about what he's going to do or what was going to happen? What, 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 I have to start allowing my point of reference to be the Bible. The prophecy of the scripture because God said this was going to happen. He said the Messiah was coming. He said Israel, the, he said Jerusalem will be trampled down and crumbled. AD 70, exactly what Jesus said, it happened. That there's so much accuracy concerning the time in which we live now that have been prophesied thousands of years before. Am I pausing and stopping and saying, man, I need to know this book. I need to spend a little bit more time in here. The devil's trying to keep me away from my Bible. The enemy didn't want me to doubt what's being said here in the scripture. But it is God breathed. It is God inspired. It's what God has sent for so that we wouldn't be confused. But now instead of us using the Bible and the scripture as a point of reference, we're so busy looking at what's happening in our favorite movie. Or what Oprah said. Or what he said. Or this person said. Or we have people that are crazy fanatics that are twisting the scriptures prophetically. I want to be able to discern that too. Because everybody that's using the word isn't using the word right. So I want to be able to discern that too. God, I want you to give me understanding and help me to discern the times. Well, the way in which I'm able to discern the time and then know what to do is I have to start getting a little bit deeper into my word. Taking time to pray and ask God to help me to, to gain understanding of what he's spoken through his scriptures. I can't just sit there and just listen to what's, uh, to, to what's everything that's going on and just getting inundated with all this information that I don't stop and say, God, I'm turning off the, I'm turning off the noise. And God, I just, I want to, I want to just spend time. I want to take and I just want to read the book of the books of first and second Peter. I want to just get this willy in my spirit. I want to take this month and I want to just get into the book of John. I want to read the book of John. I just really want to just hear what Jesus had to say. Matter of fact, I want to take the gospels and I want to take every single gospel. And what I want to do is read everything that's written in red. Everything that's written in red, I want to just get that in my spirit. I just want to get it in my spirit. Whatsoever things Jesus has said in his Bible, I want to get that in my spirit right now. I want to hear the words that came from his mouth. I want it in my spirit. But the devil, what he does is he's very crafty at keeping us away from the scripture. And then as he keeps us away from the scripture, we lose our point of reference for what's going on in this season and what's going on in the planet. Not only just for what's going on in the planet, but also for what's going on in your personal life. What season does God have you in? Are, are you able to discern the times in which you're living in where you're at in God's progression in your life? Where am I at right now? Where, at, at what season does God have me in? God takes us through various seasons and times in our lives, and then he helps us to know what to do by getting in the word of God and then using as a point of, man, I feel like right now, I feel like I am like Elijah, man. I feel like I'm running from a spirit of Jezebel. I'm in a cave, man. I'm sitting here, and then I'm trying to give God my pity party, and then God said, he's not having my pity party. I feel like I'm right here. This is where I'm at. I got to get some of this self-righteousness out of my life because I think I'm the only one when I'm not the only one. So God just has me in that place right now. You know what? I feel like I'm like Job right now. Everything done fell apart in my life. I feel like, like God is just, I don't know what is going on. All I know is I'm not going to curse God and die. I know I'm just going to continue to give God the glory. It, do, it doesn't seem right right now, but I'm just going to keep on praising God. I got some friends that's hating too, but I'm going to keep it, keep it just, I'm going to stay focused on God. That's how I feel right now. I just feel like I, man, I just feel like I'm King David. I just feel like I just beat the devil down real good, chopped his neck off. 
That's how I feel right now. I feel like, man, I just had a great victory in my life. It was powerful the way God just brought me out. And you know, people thought, tried to, didn't think I could do it. But by the grace of God, I just, I know I didn't literally cut the devil's head off, but I know the devil is on the run right now. See, what happens is you start getting in the Bible, and then that starts to become your point of reference. Your point of reference starts to become those things that are going, and you're able to see this is where I'm at right now. I feel like this is where I'm at right now. Instead of, well, the reason why I'm in this situation, because my mother, she didn't hug me five times a day, and I'm in this situation because my dad, he wasn't there, and I'm in this situation because everybody did everything wrong to me, and it's everybody else's fault, and, and I don't feel like good right now, and that's the season I'm in. I'm just trying to discover every little thing that anybody did to me. So I can be offended at everybody. And then go through my checklist to make sure that I check everybody off that did any little thing to me. That's where I'm at. And hey, I understand. You know, we got to forgive people. But saints, don't be stuck in your past. And you are not what happened to you. Can I have an amen? Dust yourself off. Can I have an amen? Dust yourself off. Look yourself in the mirror and say, if God be for me, who can be against me? I'm going to rise up from these ashes and I'm going to forgive everybody that I need to forgive. And I'm going to make sure that everybody knows that God is on my side and I'm not going to sit here blaming everybody for my problems because I did some things to get myself in some real bad trouble myself. Can I have an amen, y'all? We got to get out of that. But we do is we get into these, we get into the cycles and we don't use biblical principles and biblical references to be able to discern even in our personal lives where are you at what's the time that you're living in and then what do you do Jesus made it clear if if if, if somebody did someone something to you no matter who it is you forgive them forgive them he said how many times you forgive them Y'all know y'all Bibles. I don't even have to preach this to you know. He says 70 times 7. That's a lot. Now, he, didn't, he said forgive them. He didn't say trust them. Can I have an amen? I forgave you, but I'm not putting the knife back in your hand. Yet, forgiveness is free gift, is a free gift. You have to forgive. Trust is earned over time. It's earned over time. So I know this season that I'm in is a season where God is having me. Yes, I'm going to revisit some things, but, the, but I'm just going to forgive. And then I'm going to make sure that, that if a person wants access back into my life, there has to be a little bit of, let's, let's, it's got to be patient because we got, we got to earn some trust here. And that, listen, that'll save you. That'll save you a lot of money. See, I know, I know some of the counselors, you might be listening to me right you don't want to hear this, but th let's get the people really free by teaching them how to forgive, amen, and then work through things and then forgive and then trust over time. I just lost some money, you know what I mean? <laughs> but what happens is that's what happens. Jesus told us this is how you do So we understand the times do you understand the time in that you're in right now? The season you're in right now? The season. Are you able to discern the time and then know what to do? Right now, some people are in a season where, and I, and I love this, where God's breaking you. It's okay. You're going to be all right. Just respond right. God's breaking you. When, when Shirley Beaver said to me, she said, 
Pastor, she said this before I even had the church. She said, Napoleon, he sa she said, you're dying. And I didn't argue with her. I said, you know what, you're right. I'm dying. God's trying to kill something in me. It's just God. She said, but you'll be fine. I said, I know, I'll be fine. I'm not saying I like it. I'm not saying, Lord, do it, you know. I'm, saying, <laughs> I'm, sure Jacob, I'm sure Jacob didn't like the rest of his life. He was walk with a limp. Can I have an amen, y'all? But that was the season. That was the time. Are you able to discern it? I'm able to discern not only those things that are big in terms of what's going on in the planet and, and, in, the and, and, in, uh, and in what's going on in the nations. I'm, I'm also able to now peer it down and say, okay, now I'm able to discern the times, to know the times, understand the times. I understand this time, and I know what to do. God's breaking me. What do I do when God's breaking me? And I'm in that season where God is, I have to yield. Don't fight him. Just yield. Yield to what God is doing. Yield to the correction. Yield to the instruction. Yield to God putting you back together. And then yield to the fact that when he gets done with you, you're not going to look the same way that you used to look. And be okay with the new you. Be okay with the new you that he's making you. Be okay with that. And then God, did, then now you're starting to, I discern this time. Okay, I know I got to yield. This is what I do. Don't fight this. Don't fight this. Don't fight it. Man, God is blessing you. You're in such a season of blessing. What do you do? You stay faithful to God. When God lifts you up out of the dirt, don't lose your mind. discern this is what God is doing okay now Lord help me not to mess this up some people are used to just being so low that when God takes them high they start getting lifted up with pride and then God then next thing you know I, what do I need God for do you know what to do after God has ex exposed the time to you gave you revelation concerning the time God is this a season of blessed prosperity and blessing just hit my life now what do you do I don't get complacent I don't stop doing the things that help me become who God is asking me to become I continue to yield to God and then allow him to continue to take me to heights I don't mess it up but now thinking I don't, I don't I'm good now yeah, she came back, bruh. Yeah, she came back. You know, I was struggling for a while there, and she came back, and we good now. So, hey, I, you know, my prayer life kind of shifted. I so said, you was praying when she was gone? Oh, yeah, I was praying, fasting, seeking God, going, going to church. I was there, I was there, I was there. I was, uh, lay hands on me, throw some oil on me, do whatever you need to do. I need to get this girl back. I can't be living. I need my girl. I need my girl back. I got him back. I got him back. I got my job back. They hire me. Yeah. Yeah, I got I got my I got my car back. I got the house I really wanted. I got it. I got it. I moved to it oh man, neighborhood I wanted. It's a little bit farther from church. But I'm got in the gated community. I wouldn't even wanted to get in. Oh, you did, you did. So, so you you you're a little bit farther. Yeah, yeah. So, are you are you are you still coming to church? Well, you know, <laughs> I'm talking about what to do during the season. Oh no, I, do you know what to do? Oh no, I was you know I was thinking about coming to church, but you know they are streaming it. You know, they are streaming it, so, you know. Don't you want to go fishing, honey, today? Yeah, we can go fishing, and then we could do is we can take and we can stream the service on the boat. <laughs> what you going to do? What you you going to make that mac and cheese? Yeah. So you're not going to church. No, we're not going to church. We're we going to church, though. 
I'm preaching to somebody. Don't, turn, don't you turn that television off. Don't you. You better not turn that TV off. <laughs> you know, and I'm not saying it's bad to stay, you know, watch it live stream. It's a blessing. That's what, you know, but I'm saying you better know this time. You have to discern the time and know and now what and know what to do. When God does bless you, don't lose your mind. So we learn how to do this, and then we always use the Scripture as our point of reference. The prophecy of the Scripture helps us to be able to discern the time, to understand the time, and then helps us to know what to do. But do we take the time to say, Lord, this is where, this is where I feel like I'm at. This is what's going on in the planet. How do we respond to this that we see taking place on the earth? And where are we at right now? How can I, how can I find my sense of rest and peace knowing that everything that's coming, now listen to me, saints, everything that's coming, God said was going to come. I'm not confused. I'm not in doubt. I'm not in fear. I'm not overwhelmed. Because everything that, that is taking place on the planet, God said this stuff would happen. It should bring me great peace. It should bring me great comfort knowing that my God told me beforehand, these are the things you're going to have to deal with going forward. This is the prophecy of the scripture. This should give you great peace knowing, okay, you're in this season. Okay, this is what Jesus said will happen. So we've got to find our, ourselves and go through it. Can I have an amen? I want to go from here, and we're going to end with this. And I want to read some of the things. The book of Matthew. That Jesus said what happened. So that we're able to discern, understand the times, and then know what to do. Now look at this. Matthew chapter 24. Verse 1. And we're going to read on down. To verse 31. We're going to end with this. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. So Jesus prophetically is telling them don't get enamored with all these buildings he said you see this he said all this is coming down now imagine him saying this during that period of time when you have this huge temple you have people that are going in and out selling wares you have the the community is is basically this is the centerpiece and everything revolves around that he said, this is coming down. And what he said, we see it came to pass. Now, what it says here in verse, thir- at verse 3. He said, now, now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one what, y'all, this is this one of the biggest problems that we have going on right now. And this is why I'm trying to point everybody to this. Biggest problem that you have with deception is the person that's deceived doesn't know that they're deceived. That's the problem with deception. Deception gets you to think that what you're doing is right. Not knowing that you're deceived. He said, take heed that no one deceives you. Deception is, is so prevalent right now. And it's, it's, and it's so sad because deception always plays on your desires. 
It plays on your desires. One of the main ways that you and I are going to get deceived is when we really desire something, the devil comes along and he gives us exactly what we want. Fall down and worship me, Jesus, and I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. Jesus, in combating the devil, he referenced the scripture. He fought back with the word of God. And it's the same thing that we have to do. Our desires can blind us and our desires can take us to a place where it can lead us down a road of deception. You know, curiosity is not in and of itself a bad thing, but it can be a bad thing when you know God is telling you to do something differently. Right? Eve, all Eve had to do was look at the tree and say, no, God says I can't, I can't do that. But she saw that it was good for food. And she got curious. And her curiosity went down, got her going down the wrong way. And it's the same thing that happens to us sometimes, saints, as we're living in this life. Deception comes along because there's something we desire. And then the devil just dangles a little carrot. Hey, hey, do this. What don't you? And then instead of us saying, no, 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 God said I can't do that. I can't, no, no, no. Well, our curiosity starts to take us down this road. I wonder what happened if I press this button right here on my computer. I wonder what's back there. I know I see a, you know, a, a, I, I know I see a naked lady, but, but I, I, I don't think that that's, I, I wonder what, I wonder how else, is there any other ones back there? I wonder if I just press that, what would happen if I, are they going to start spamming me? <laughs> Somebody said, mm hmm <laughs> I wonder if I, curiosity, and then you get the, and then next thing you know, person goes down the road, then you open yourself up to deception. Right? And then the devil comes in, and that's what happens. This is what, this is what happens. This is what happens in life. And then people don't realize, I wonder if I just, if I just, you know, I, I, I know, I know I, I want to date him, but I don't think he's saved yet. Well, you know, what if he never wants to get saved? Well, at least I could try. What if she never wants to get saved? I think I, I think I, 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 I mean, she's cute. She's cute. Maybe I should just see. You know, I just go on a couple dates. You know, ain't nothing, ain't nothing happening. Listen to me, saints. Then a person gets deceived. Then next thing you know, you start, you start going on a date. and then, Well, you know, I can see the good qualities. And if I could just bring him to church and then God can lay, the pastor can lay hands on this brother. And the Holy Ghost would knock him out and fill him with the Holy Spirit. Then it would get. I'm preaching today. I got some amens in my pocket. <laughs> Amen, Pastor Napoleon. What's happening? And it's called deception. We go down the road. Jesus said, take heed that no man deceive you. Get into your Bible. It's your point of reference. He says, he says here, verse, this is the first thing he says. Then he says, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and do what? Deceive me. I was just telling the, the, the uh, leadership team this morning. I said, y'all, listen, we have to be careful because there's a difference between um, representing someone and reflecting someone. He said, they're going to come in my name. They're representing, they're claiming to represent Christ, but the key is, do they reflect Christ? There's no true authentic representation or um, in the sight of God if there's not reflection. You can't say that you represent Christ, but you don't reflect him in your life. And so here he says, for many will come in my name saying I am the Christ and will do what? Deceive me. So we have to be careful. 
and always use the prophecy as a, of the scripture as a point of reference to know the times and then to know what to do. He says here in verse 6, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not what y'all troubled for all these things might, must come to pass but the end is not yet. So now when I see things going on on the news, I don't flip out. I don't prepare my bug out bag. I don't start panicking. He said, don't be troubled. He said, don't be troubled. Now, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't buy some more toilet paper. <laughs> I know I'm preaching now. <laughs> I know I'm preaching now. It don't mean that you shouldn't get you some more toiletries. Because <laughs> we saw what happened last time, y'all. So be, be, be a little, what do they call it, Pre, uh, preemptive. So we got to make sure we do stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. But we don't get troubled. You don't get, your spirit doesn't get agitated to the place where now you start opening the door to fear and anxiety and worry and doubt. And you start getting scared. Jesus said, this is what's going to happen. He says, discern the time. He says, this is what you do. He said, don't be troubled. He says in verse 7, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famine, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. Have we been seeing that, saints? Aren't you grateful that God told you beforehand that this is what he was going to do and what was going to happen on the planet? Because we have the prophecy of the scripture. And it is our points of reference. So we can discern the time and then also know what to do. He said this is what's going to happen. He says in verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrow. So this tells me the true sorrow hasn't hit yet. This is just the beginning. We're seeing the, but I have enough discernment and revelation to understand, okay, this is, we're heading in a direction. We're not confused. We're not there yet. But we're heading in a direction. Verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation. Now watch this. And kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Oh. So you're telling me, Jesus, that I could die for this thing? For my commitment to you? My faithfulness to you? My willingness to stand firm on your truths and who you are, that this actually could cost me my life. And you're not trying to hide that from me. It's not a mystery. You're telling me that the times will come when this is what's going to happen to people that are faithfully committed to you. It should be sobering for all of us that the that, that Christianity isn't a game, it's not a joke, it's not something that we just look at as just some religious thing to do. That Jesus is telling us that at the end of the age and as we approach the end of this age that, that you're going to have opposition to the point that they may want to kill you. And have we got it in our heart that, you know what, I don't care. I am willing to lay down my life for Christ because he laid down his life for me. I do not consider my life dear to myself. That I might fulfill God's purpose in my life. That I can, how can I turn on the Lord when he turned to me and gave me everything that I have and blessed my life and changed my life and renewed and restored me? How can I turn on the, the Lord? Jesus is saying here, he says, this is what will take place. And it will take place because of his namesake. And this is another thing that we have to see, men and women of God, is that the devil is very good at, at, at helping us to go down a road of self-preservation. Well, if I if I. I, I can, I, I, I'm not going to deny the Lord, but I'm not going to say I know him. And that way, I can stay here, and then I can tell more people about Jesus. How deceptive is that? 
How about I'm a, I'm a Christian? I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and covered in the blood of Jesus. And that Jesus died for me, bled for me, went to the grave for me, and got up out of the grave and sitting on the right hand of the Father for me. And I would not be anything, anywhere, in any place if it had not been for the goodness and grace of God in my life. I cannot deny the things that I've heard and seen. Can I have an amen? That's what has to go through our mind. To the point that where you're not afraid to die. And the reason why, because you know that he is the source of your life. And to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Can I have an amen? I tell you right now, Deacon Bobby Winfield isn't crying right now, Deacon is Jackie. I'm like, Lord, would you hurry up so we can get with you too? We need the Lord to come. But we have, we've created a culture, even within the church of such self-preservation, that this scripture, we have to see, this is in the Bible, and it's what Jesus said, that this is what's going to happen. So stop thinking that Christianity is a popularity contest. They're going to try to kill us. And we have to be firm in our commitment to Christ, and we don't just go to church, we become the church. Can I have an amen, y'all? He says in verse 10, he says, And many will be offended, betray one another, and will hate one another. This is the reason why I was talking to you guys earlier about forgiveness. Don't let offense get into your heart. Don't let it. Offense is devilish. Jesus said many will be offended and that's what you see happening right now. Just turn on your television. The devil is strategically sending forth messages to help people become offended. Blacks against whites and whites against blacks and Chinese and then political and you are a Republican and you are a Democrat and you are this and you are that and then everybody gets offended and then people begin to hate one another and betray one another and then all this stuff starts spilling on in the church and then people can't even get along. I'm telling y'all right now that life is not black and white. Life is in living color. Can I have an amen? And you have to be able to see in living color. But we made this thing because the devil wants to get everybody offended at each other and hate one another. That's all he's doing. Hey, oh, so you're, oh, you're a Republican, huh? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're a Democrat. Oh, oh, my goodness. How could you? Oh, you're, you're black? Oh, wow. <laughs> you're white? <laughs> you're white, huh? <laughs> And then we just do this stuff, right? And we do this stuff. And then the Lord's sitting there looking at us. Like how, how immature and foolish can we be? When every single person on this planet has one source of your origin, all of us came through Adam. And we allow our cultural our cultural backgrounds to so define us that we look at other colors and we, and we become offended and bitter at them. When every single nation upon the face of this earth, since the beginning of time, men have been killing one another. Jesus said this was going to happen. We, don't, we know what to do. We don't let this happen to us. Don't get offended. I don't care what anybody does to you. You forgive them, and you don't let a root of bitterness get in your heart, and you have unforgiveness towards that person. Do not let it happen. Can I have an amen? He says, and many will be offended, will be betray one another, and will hate one another. He says, there will be, there, there, uh, then many false prophets will rise up, deceiving many. This is why I'm pointing you to the prophecy of the scripture. And because lawlessness will abound. 
The love of many will grow cold. How many know we got lawlessness going on in the land? Lawlessness. And let me tell you where lawlessness starts out, y'all. Just so y'all know, it starts out in the home. We just let stuff go on in, the ho- in our own houses. We let, we let our kids act a fool, and then, we, and then we, we don't have good government structure within our house so that if there's peace that takes place, so then there's violation. When you violate one another, it causes people to get offended and get hurt. And then as a result of that, it just be, lawlessness just begins to continue to spread. But, but good boundaries help to bring peace. We can't allow lawlessness to start off in our homes and then spill over into the communities and then throughout all of the land. And this is what's happened. We just lawlessness, you know. I mean, we, we, we don't want any boundaries. People don't want any boundaries. And then when people violate each other, then people's love vow gets turned off because they've been violated. And, and he says it here, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And so we have lawlessness in the land. We have to start teaching, you know, starting off in our home, teaching our kids Making sure we, our homes are in order so that there's peace there and there's not lawlessness everywhere. I was watching, a, <laughs> I was watching me and my wife, we were watching this thing on Gary Payton. <laughs> Gary Payton, you know the basketball player Gary Payton? Great basketball player. He said when he was little, his dad, he was in the classroom and he was cutting up in the classroom. He was acting a fool. And we know Gary Payton can talk. So he was acting a fool in the class. He didn't, and this was back in the day, you know. So his mom, I mean his teacher got on the phone and called his dad. He called his dad and said, hey, your son's down here acting a fool. (laughs) And so he said, I'll be right there. So, So Gary Payton's dad came in the class and Gary didn't see it. Because he had his back turned and he was acting a fool. (laughs) He said, he said right there in front of all of the kids, Gary's dad jammed him up. And he said, uh, the guy was like, man, I heard, I heard your dad jammed you up in the class when he was interviewing. I heard your dad jammed. He said, yeah, that was a good one. That was a good one. He got me with that one. And what ended up happening is he jammed him up right there in front of the class in front of everybody. Whatever happened to that, y'all? Do we need some more of that again? We need we need some more of that. We would be like, you know, but nowadays, if you say anything, you you say anything, you say anything to the kid, hey, you need to sit down. I'm gonna tell my mama on you. And then the mama go down there and get mad at the teacher. When they acting a fool in the class, Gary's dad grabbed him and yoked him up right there in front of everybody. Now sit down here, don't act a fool and learn something so you can get out of Oakland and do something with your life. Can I have an amen, y'all? And so what happens is we we have lawlessness is just so permeating all throughout the land. And then we as a church can see it. We should be able to discern it and then also know what to do when we see the lawlessness. But do we? It says here, In verse 13 and 14, we're going to close. He says, but he who endures to the end shall be what? Saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Jesus is telling us what's going to happen. And he's telling us so that we can be able to discern, understand the times, and then know what to do. He's telling us very clearly here that if you're going to make it, you have to endure to the end. And I've been saying this lately because it's been in my spirit. Son, don't just know how to take off in the plane. You have to know how to land it. I don't want... 
to just know how to take off. I want to know how to land it. I want to endure to the end. A lot of people are going to know, are going to take off and fly with Jesus, but then when it comes time to landing the plane, do they know how to land it? John the Baptist knew how to land it. Peter knew how to land it. Paul knew how to land it. James knew how to land it. You search the scripture and you find John, he's on the island of Patmos all by himself, but he's landing the plane. He didn't flip out in the end of his life, turn from all the things that he knew, went down another path and forsake Christ and then go back to the world while still naming the name of Christ. Saints, today my prayer is, is that all of us, that God allows the anointing and the grace of Issachar to fall upon us, that we know the times and can discern the times and understand the times, but then we also know what to do. And we know what to do because the prophecy of the Scripture makes it perfectly clear for us what to do. And we've, we're taking time to get into this Bible to say, God, show me. You're not confused about anything that's coming our way. You've already told us what was going to happen. And as we do this, saints, when it starts getting darker out here, we get brighter. And people will run to our light to say, what must I do to be saved? But if I'm acting like the world and in confused and, and just, just don't know what I'm doing, then how can I help them? Lord, give me the grace of Essachar to, to know the times, to know what to do, and to understand the times and to know what to do. To discern the times and to know what to do. So that as we're preaching and we're teaching, that we're not confused. And then we don't allow, allow bitterness and hatred and envy and jealousy and, and unforgiveness to get in our hearts. Because Jesus said this was going to happen. Watch it. We don't allow lawlessness in our lives. And it starts in the home. We don't allow lawlessness in the church. We don't allow lawlessness in the church. Jesus said it was coming. We don't allow it to happen in, in our midst because he said this is what's coming. Watch out for these things. Father, this morning, as we stand in your wonderful presence, we thank you that you are raising up as we approach the end of this age, a generation of those that have the spirit of Issachar. I thank you that, God, you are crafting them, you are developing them, you are making them even now. And they are not just older, they are younger. Across the board, you are raising up individuals that are able to discern the times, to understand the times, and then know what to do. Lord, we thank you that your Bible is our point of reference. You've prophetically told us what was coming. We don't want to be hypocritical and know everything that's going to take place from an earthly standpoint, a natural standpoint, but we can't discern in the spirit. God, grow us up and mature us. Help us to be individuals that the world will look to as a beacon of light. That we're not full of lawlessness and bitterness and hatred that now we're not consumed with offenses getting offended at everybody and having prejudice in our heart that Lord we are free in you and I pray this morning that as a congregation that even now you would release Lord such a grace to understand and to know to understand the times and to know what to do Give us revelation. Give us revelation, Lord. Father, we just bless you this morning. We thank you for your spirit. Holy Spirit, as we get into this Bible, peel back the veil. Mm. Peel back the veil and help us to read and gain understanding. Help us to know what to do. 
God, we just give you praise this morning. And we thank you. We thank you. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen, amen, amen. Amen, y'all. God is good. God is good. If you need prayer for anything this morning, I want you to come down to the altar and just sit before the Lord. We're not going to pray for you. I want you to go before the Lord and watch Him touch you in this moment. The altar is open. You can come down and just sit in the presence of God. Thank you all for coming out. And thank you all for watching today. May God bless you and keep you is my prayer. Amen.